stay with us for 10 or 20 seconds whilst others uh, join us from the waiting room. Um, for those of you who have joined us before, welcome back. Um, for those of you who haven't joined us before, a very warm welcome from us, the, the Zionist Federation and the World Zionist Organization here in the UK, and to also the, um, the, the Gifnock Shul community in, in, in Glasgow. Um, who And we have the Shaliach here with us this evening, um, Aaron Hodaya. So uh, just bear with us for a few more seconds whilst we have, we've got a lot of people here joining us tonight. Um, as, as always, just a, a couple of house rules. Um, for those of you who have, who have joined us before, more recently, you, um, you'll be aware that we're leaving everyone's videos on. It's up to you if you want to turn them off. Um, but we would ask that you all mute your microphones. Um, and this, this is nothing to do with us not wanting to hear from you, but it's, it's basically so that we have um, minimal background noise when our, when our guest speaker is, is speaking. So if all of you could um, just mute your microphones, leave your videos on with pleasure. And um, throughout the evening, uh, can we just have, can, can I ask that there's someone who's got some quite bad background noise? If you could all um, switch off your switch off your 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 microphones, um, we'll we'll ask you periodically through the chat facility to submit any questions that you'll have for our speaker this evening. So please do ask um, ask whatever questions you have, and we'll do our very best to 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 get as many to them as many of them answered as as possible. So I think um, you know that's enough from me. Uh, Welcome to everyone, and I'm going to pass over now to our uh, to the WZO's Shaliach in in Glasgow, who is Aharon, um, and he will uh, he will also say a few words, and then he will welcome our guest speaker of the evening. So that's over for me, and over to you, Aharon. Okay, hi everyone. So. I'm Aaron, this is Odaya. We are the youth couple in Gifnak Shul in Glasgow, and also the WZO Shlichim and the Jewish chaplain for Scottish universities. And it is really an honor, on behalf of the whole uh, Gifnak Shul community, we're very honored to host this and partner with WZO UK. And we're really happy to see everyone. And I just want to say uh, Monday is Yom Yerushalayim, and I we heard Naftali already twice, uh, the story, it's really an inspiring story. It's a, it's a story that for us as, as young people, it's maybe, um, maybe the most recent Aliyah story of a group in, mm. in that, that's kind of a, in our age that I have friends who've been part of this story. Um, and we really are happy, you know, towards Yom Yerushalayim. Yom Yerushalayim is the connection between the Ethiopian community and Yerushalayim is a very strong connection that I hope that Naftali would know this would speak about uh, better than I can, um, but it's very, very exciting, and I think it's a very great preparation for Yom Yerushalayim. So, uh, Naftali, welcome. Thank you so much, uh, Aaron and Hodaya, and uh, good evening, everybody. It's a big honor for me to be here in my city in Israel, in Be'er Sheva, and to speak with you a little bit about my community, and I hope that in the next uh, 45 minutes, uh, I will be able to give you some information that you never had, and that you will learn more about the beautiful uh, of the Beta Israel community. Um, my name Aftali, is- you can raise off, thank you. Hold on. My thank name you. Is, uh, thank Akram. you for letting me in. For some reason, I have some problem. Hold on. Um, so my name is Naftali Aklum. I was born in Ethiopia in 1979, and I am the youngest of 12 brothers and sisters. My family were among the first group to do the journey from Ethiopia to Sudan and from Sudan to Israel. Now for this lecture, I will use my PowerPoint. Um, so I will share my screen to use the PowerPoint.
Okay. So this is uh, pictures of my family. Uh, in the middle, you can see my brother, may you rest in, my father, may you rest in peace. Uh, in the left, you can see my sister, my two sisters and my mother. And in the right, you can see some of my brothers. All those pictures were taken in Ethiopia before we made Aliyah to Israel. Now, one of the questions that most of the people ask me when we speak about the Jews from Ethiopia is how Ethiopian Jews arrived to that country in East Africa. We have two versions of how the Ethiopian Jews came to Ethiopia. The first version is the version of King Solomon and Queen Sheba. As you all know, King Solomon was the wisest man on earth and all the kings and the queens at that time wanted to have some advice from, from King Solomon, wanted to meet him. Queen Sheba used to control the countries that we know today, such as Ethiopia, Eritrea, Yemen, Sudan, and some part of Egypt. All this area used to called ancient Kush. And she was the queen of Kush. Now Queen Sheba also heard about King Solomon. So she came here. They fell in love and they brought a son to the world, Menelik, who later became the first king of Ethiopia. When Menelik was 14 years old, he told his mother that he wants to know her, his father more. So he came here, he spent a few months with his father. After a few months, his father, King Solomon, told him, son, you have to go back to Ethiopia. But King Solomon didn't send his son alone. He sent thousands of people back with him to Ethiopia. And some believe that he gave him also the Ark of Covenant. Some believe that we came out from the thousands of people that King Solomon sent back with his son to Ethiopia. This is the first version. The second version of how Ethiopian Jews arrived to Ethiopia, it's after the destruction of the first temple. When King Nebuchadnezzar came and conquered this area, we had the 12 tribes here. One tribe decided to escape to the south to Egypt. Now we have the Blue Nile River and we have the White Nile River. The Blue Nile River starts in Ethiopia and it goes down to Egypt. The White Nile River starts in Sudan and it goes down to Egypt as well. This tribe walked through the Blue Nile River until they ended up in Ethiopia. And we are speaking about the tribe of Dan. We, the Ethiopian Jews, believe that we are the lost tribe of Dan. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we're speaking about ancient community. Community that for thousands of years kept Judaism and we were isolated, which means the Ethiopian Jewish community never had some relationship to any other Jewish community in the world until the beginning of the 20th century. Until then, we were isolated. We thought we are the only Jews left in this world. And if we will not keep Judaism, Judaism will disappear. Christianity came to Ethiopia in the fourth century. And throughout the history of Ethiopia as a country, always there were kings, and queens that wanted to convert the Ethiopian Jewish community into Christianity. We kept Judaism in the diaspora, sometimes with our life. In Ethiopia, the non-Jews used to call us Falasha. Now, what is the meaning of the word Falasha? Falasha means a stranger, someone who is not in his land. This is how the non-Jews used to call us in Ethiopia. We called ourselves Beta Israel community. Why? Because we wanted to remind ourselves that we are part of Am Israel. And by the way, due to that, that we were isolated for so many years, we never had 
the oral Torah. All we had was the written Torah. Because again, we left after the destruction of the first temple. At that time, there was no oral Torah, only written Torah. And we were isolated, which means no one told us that there is one more Torah. But it was only at the beginning of the 20th century that the world knew that there are Jews in Ethiopia. 1973, a very important year in the history of the Ethiopian Jews. In 1973, Rabbi Ovadia Yosef, may you rest in peace, was the chief rabbi, the Sfaradi chief rabbi here in Israel. And Rabbi Ovadia Yosef was the first rabbi to say it loud and clear, Ethiopian Jews are Jews and we have to bring them from Ethiopia to Israel. In 1975, the Ashkenaz chief rabbi, Rabbi Shlomo Goren, also announced Ethiopian Jews are Jews and we have to bring them from Ethiopia to Israel. Now, when you have two chief rabbis here in Israel, one Sfaradi, one Ashkenazi, claiming and saying that the Ethiopian Jews are Jews, it means that in 1975, the government of Yitzhak Rabin, may rest in peace, have to apply the law of return on the Ethiopian Jews. And this is exactly what happened. In 1975, the government of Yitzhak Rabin applied the law of return on the Ethiopian Jews, which means the Ethiopian Jews finally can take a flight from Addis Ababa, the capital of Ethiopia, to Ben Gurion. Unmuted me. Uh, and to fulfill their dream to return back home to Zion. But unfortunately, <coughs> Ethiopian Jews didn't came in 1975. They didn't came in 1976, and they didn't came in 1977. I would like to show you a video that will explain to you why Ethiopian Jews were not able to come in 1974, 1975, and throughout the 70s. Ethiopia, 1974. Haile Selassie's feudal regime collapses. The military takes over. Women, children, they try to reach to Jerusalem, and they didn't get it. Six hundred children. אבא שלי קוראים פרד, היה זה זו אקלון. והיו לו כל כך הרבה כובעים, מצד אחד היה את הכובע של איש חינוך. הכובע השני שלו היה אקטיביסט. כובע נוסף, הפסוק של ג'יימס בונד. מאז 
העניין היה בעצם, ואנחנו רוצים את המשפחה שלנו. הם דורשים וקוראים רק להצלת בני משפחותיהם. אנשים מתו ברעב, אנשים מתו במחלות, אני רוצה להוציא כל עוד שאני יכול, אני יכול להציל אנשים. אני לקחתי את עצמי כמשימה פעיל של לעשות אותו. In 1977, in Israel, we had election here, and the Likud party won the election for the first time, and the new prime minister is Menachem Begin. Menachem Begin was a very important prime minister because one of the first things that Menachem Begin did as a prime minister was to invite to his office the head of the Mossad then, Yitzhak Khofi, and he told him, bring me the Ethiopian Jews. That was one of the first thing that Menachem Begin did as a prime minister. He wanted the Ethiopian Jews to come to Israel. But even though he wanted, still there was no way to bring the Ethiopian Jews. Now Mangisto Hale Mariam, the dictator from Ethiopia, had some problem. When you are a dictator, you will always have individuals or groups that will start to rebel against you. Same thing happened in Ethiopia. There was a group called TPLF, Tigray People Liberation Front, that started to rebel against Mangistu Haile Mariam regime. Now Mangistu needed some help and he asked the government of Israel to help him with some weapon and advice. And after a few meetings, we had what we call the arm deal. The arm deal, it's a deal between Ethiopia and Israel. It, uh, Israel is willing to give weapon and advice to Mangisto Haile Mariam so that he will be able to fight against those groups that started to rebel against him. And in return, all you have to do is to let some thousands of Ethiopian Jews to leave the country. Mangisto Haile Mariam agreed Everyone agreed, but Mangisto Haile Mariam had one condition. It has to be a secret deal. And in 1977, in November 1977, for the first time, the Mossad is coming to Ethiopia. Now those Mossad agents coming to the capital city, Addis Ababa in Ethiopia, they don't speak the language the national language Amharic. They don't understand the new culture in Ethiopia, but most important, they don't know exactly where are the Jews uh, villages, which mean they needed help. And one of the people that they were asking help from was my late brother, Ferede Yazezo Aklo. My, brothers, my brother in the seventies was a teacher. The organization ORT opened school in the beginning of the 60s in the, in the Ethiopian Jewish village, villages to prepare the community for the day that they will come to Israel. My brother was a teacher in one of their schools. And the Mossad agent approached to my brother and they told him, we have a list of 120 Ethiopian Jews from the Gondar area. This is the map of Ethiopia. Ethiopian Jews used to live in the northern side of Ethiopia, 
in Tigray, in Gondar. In the middle, you can see the capital city, Addis Ababa. My brother was a teacher in Gondar. And the Mossad people told my brother, we have a list of 120 Ethiopian Jews. We want you to bring them from Gondar to Addis Ababa so that they will be able to fulfill their dream to go back home to Zion. Now you have to understand, in Ethiopia, the only dream we have, it's one day to return back home to Zion. So my brother had that dream as well. And he told the Mossad agent, I'm willing to help, but I want to be one of the 120 Ethiopian Jews that going to Israel. The Mossad told my brother, it's a pilot. We will have more groups in the future. In the meantime, we need your help. So when my brother saw those people coming from Israel to save his community, he said to himself, I must help them. And this is exactly what he did. He found, organized the 120 Ethiopian Jews from Gondar, and he brought them to Addis Ababa. By the way, by bus from Gondar to Addis Ababa in the 70s, we are speaking about more than three days on the road. So it's not an easy road. In January, 1978, for the first time, 120 Ethiopian Jews coming legally to Israel. Few weeks after this group arrived, the foreign minister at that time in Israel was Moshe Dayan. Now Moshe Dayan had a press conference in Geneva and one of the journalists asked him about the deal between Ethiopia and Israel. Now we all know it's a secret deal, but unfortunately Moshe Dayan spoke freely about this deal and he told the world about the deal between Ethiopia and Israel. The next day, the whole world will know about the deal between Ethiopia and Israel. When the dictator from Ethiopia, Mangisto Haile Mariam, heard about it, the first thing that he did was to cancel the deal. The second thing that he did was to tell all the Mossad agents that are in the land of Ethiopia to leave immediately. But he did one more thing. He started to chase after all the Ethiopian Jews activists that took part in this deal. One of them is my brother. So my brother, Ferede Yazezo Aklu, became a wanted man in his own country. Now to be a wanted man in Ethiopia in the 70s, under the regime of Mangisto Haile Mariam, it means that if they, they will catch you, you are a dead man. Now, what would you do if you know that your life is at risk? You will run away. Now, let's go back to the map. My brother is in Gondar. The closest country to run to is Sudan. Now, two problems with Sudan. Sudan is a Muslim country. It's not safe for a Jew to be there. But you can hide your identity as Jew. The second problem is the distance between Gondar to the capital city of Sudan, Khartoum. We are speaking about more than 300 miles, which is about 700 kilometers. It's easy when you do it by airplane or by car, but it's tough and hard when you have to do it on a journey walking in the desert from Gondar to Sudan. My brother didn't have any other option. That was the only option in order to save his life. So at the beginning, my brother took some amount of money, some food, water. He didn't know exactly how much time it will take him, but it took him about a month to do the journey from Ethiopia to Sudan. When he arrived to Sudan, to the capital city of Sudan, Khartoum, he was weak, thirsty, dirty, hungry, name it he was. But he had two things on him that were something. He had wedding ring and he had a book with some addresses of some Mossad agent that he worked with a few months before in Ethiopia. My brother decided to sell the wedding ring. He earned 100 Sudanese lira. 
He took the money. He went to a store. He bought a, 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 a notebook and a pencil. And he started to send letters. After that, he went to the main post office in Khartoum, Sudan. And he sent letters to his contacts telling them, it's me, Fere de Aklo. I'm in Khartoum, Sudan. Please save me. Now, I want you to think for a minute about the situation. It's already 1979. My brother is in Khartoum, a Jewish guy, a black guy in a Muslim country sending a message. He's not sure that his message will arrive, but my brother is waiting another five months living as a homeless in the street of Khartoum. But after five months, not only that his message arrived, the Mossad decided to send a young Mossad agent, Danny Limor, to save my brother from the street of Khartoum and to bring him from Sudan to Israel. I will not go into details how Danny Limor found my brother in the street of Khartoum, but I can tell you that it took him three days to find my brother in Khartoum. When the two of them met, the journey of all Ethiopian Jews from Ethiopia to Sudan and from Sudan to Israel started. They opened a gate for all the Ethiopian Jews to fulfill their dream to return back home to Zion after more than 2,500 years. From 1979 until 1984, 20,000 Ethiopian Jews left their villages, going to the unknown. No one promised them that in the end they will make it to Jerusalem, but they saw an opportunity. And when that opportunity came, they all left and started a journey in the desert to fulfill their dream. When my family started this journey, I was six months old. Now think about babies, think about adults, in my village, we had an old man, 82 years old. His family told him, don't leave, stay here, you will not make it. The old man told his family, I'd rather die on my way to Jerusalem, but I will not stay here. And unfortunately, he passed away on the road. Out of the 20,000 Ethiopian Jews that left everything behind, their house, their land, their properties, their life. Out of the 20,000, 4,000 Ethiopian Jews didn't make it and died on the way. When the Ethiopian Jews already make it to Sudan, they put them in a refugee camps. And in those refugee camps, we call it our own little Holocaust. Every day, between 10 to 20 people died because of the food that they gave them in the refugee camps, disease in the refugee camps. Many Ethiopian Jewish women were raped by the Sudanese soldiers. And we've been through all this just because we wanted to return back home. We always knew Ethiopia, it's not our land. One day we will go back home. But unfortunately, we had, we had to make a big sacrifice in order to fulfill that dream. The next video is just for you to understand what we had to do and how much we suffer and sacrifice to live here today in Israel, Jerusalem. אני כותב את המכתב הזה לאנשים שלעולם לא יקראו אותו. זהו ניסיון נואש לעורר את זכרם שנשכח בתוך ים של זיכרונות עצובים בארץ מוכת האסונות הזו. הפסימים יטענו שאני מעורר מתים, הציניקנים יצהלו שאני מגזים, אבל אני חרד 
שאתם תשכחו מבלי שאף אדם ישים לב. אתם לא מאה ולא מאתיים, אלא ארבעת אלפים איש ואישה, זקנים וטף, שהאמינו שמקומם כאן. ניסיתם להגשים את חלומכם, ויצאתם למסע רגלי מפרך, דרך ג'ונגלים סבוכים, נערות גויים ומדבריות אימתניים, שבהם רוצחים ואנסים, מטילי אימה וחסרי לב. אבל נשארתם שם, במרחב האינסופי, קבורים בתוך אדמה זרה, בקבר לא מסומן. לא מעט מכם, מבלי שאיש הניח עפר על גופותיכם. אך למרות הסכנות, המשכתם לצאת בהמוניכם למסע שכמדומני לא היה כמותו מאז יציאת מצרים. צעדתם בלילות ובימים, והגעתם אל סודן הארורה. סודן פערה את פיה ואיימה לטרוף את כולנו מבלי להשאיר זכר. לא מעט מכם גרו בשכנות אליי, באותם מחנות פליטים שהפכו למלכודת מוות מדי בוקר עם זריחת השמש. גברים חסונים, אמהות רחומות, וילדים שטרם טעמו את טעם החיים, נבלו שם כפרחים בשמש. כמו כל אלה שהיו שם, נאלצתי לראות אתכם גוועים מול עיניי, וליוויתי אתכם לאותם מקומות מסתור שנקראו קברים. לא אשכח את הלילות בהם דנו איך להיפטר מגופותיכם בסתר, הרחק מעיניהם של גויים עוינים. לא אשכח את הימים בהם הפנים היו חרושות דמעות יבשות, ולא את רגעי הייאוש וחוסר האונים. לא אשכח איך כל דאגותיי היו לאלה שיישארו בחיים אחריי, ויצטרכו לסכן את עצמם בחיפוש אחר מקום לקבור את גופתי. בסודן הארורה איבדנו את כבודנו האנושי האחרון. משפחותיהם של אחדים מכם נמחקו כאילו לא נבראו מעולם. ילדים נותרו יתומים, הורים שקלו את ילדיהם, גברים איבדו את נשותיהם, ונשים נותרו ללא בעלים. את כל זה עשיתם כדי להגיע אל ארץ נחלתכם, אך לשווא. בארץ שחלמתם לחיות בה, האנשים חיים בקצב מסחרר, והזיכרון שלהם קצר מאוד. אנשים שאפילו לא זוכרים את המלחמה של הקיץ האחרון, ובוודאי שאין להם זמן לזיכרון העבר. ואני חרד שזיכרונכם יישאר נחלת מעטים, ויתפוגג לו בחלוף הדור שחווה את המסע על בשרו. So my community really made the ultimate sacrifice to return to Zion. Uh, next week, we are celebrating Jerusalem Day here in Israel. And on Jerusalem Day, we celebrate the release of Jerusalem in 1967. And it's a happy day and we are celebrating and we love our capital, our internal capital, Jerusalem. But on Jerusalem Day, we, the Ethiopian Jewish community, we also remember the 4,000 Ethiopian Jews who didn't make it and died on the way. We have ceremonies all over the country, in every city, in every town. The main event is in Jerusalem, alongside the Prime Minister and the President of Israel, And we do have to remember them. If you will meet an Ethiopian Israeli family here, every family lost someone in Sudan. So everyone have this trauma uh, of uh, losing someone in Sudan. I came to Israel in 1980 when I was one year old. One of the first city that received the Ethiopian Jews was my city in the South, Be'er Sheva. And to grow up here, it was very challenging. I grew up in a neighborhood that had 
90% Ethiopian Jews. The school that I went had the same amount, 90% Ethiopian Jews. By the way, if you're looking where I am, here I am. Uh, the school that I had, uh, that I went, had the same amount, 90% Ethiopian Jews. It means that when you wake up in the morning and go to school, and from school, you go back to your home, all you see is your community. When you put a lot of people from low economic status in one neighborhood, you will eventually create a neighborhood that will have drugs, alcohol, crime, and violence. And this is the, the neighborhood that I grew up into. And if you don't have parents that will show you the limit, you will probably will find yourself one day behind bars. As a kid, I grew up having identities problem. In one hand, I grew up a very proud Jew, a proud Israeli. But when, when I was a kid, I didn't like the color of my skin. I didn't like myself being black man because in the early 80s, from time to time here in Israel, they used to give us the nickname Negro Samba and things like that. And I realized as a kid that it's not easy to be a black man in a country that a vast majority is white, even though you live among your brothers and sisters. So I was asking God, why did you brought me to this world as a black man if it's not easy to be a black man? My generation, we was a generation that was very embarrassed about our parents. My parents came, they were old, which mean they don't know Hebrew. They don't know how to read and write. They don't have a decent job. They rely on the government. And when I was a kid, I remember that when I wanted new shoes, my parents were not able to provide me because they don't have enough money. When I wanted help in homework, my parents were not able to help me because they don't know how to read and write. When my parents wanted to go to a different office, they had to take me with them because I am the one that's supposed to translate for them. So I always looked at, at my parents as weak people. What kind of parents are you if you are not able to help me, to give me, and I am the one who always need to help you and to translate for you. So I saw them as weak people. As you all know, in the age of 18, here in Israel, it's mandatory, and we understand why we have to protect our country. We have to go to the army. So in the age of 18, I joined the Air Force and I served as a firefighter for three years. And my experience from the army, it's great. Because for me, it was the first time that I saw the Israeli society. It was the first time that I saw the one from the kibbutz, the one from the moshav, the one from, the, excuse me, the one from Tel Aviv. And beside knowing that you're giving back to your country, which is very important, the army gave me and uh, the army just opened my eyes to what we call the Israeli society. And uh, I still have lots of friends from that day and they will be friends for life. And I'm very grateful uh, to have the opportunity to serve in the army and to serve my country. But uh, as you all know, they're taking the best years in a man's life from the age of 18 till 21. And after the army, we Israelis usually take one year off. You know, we're traveling in the world. I traveled to South Asia for one year. And then I came back, I did my first degree in Ben Gurion University in Beersheba, studying politica, political science and government. And after that, I started to work in the education system. In a man's life, there is always a point that can change your life. Sometimes it can, be, it can be a good change, and sometimes it can be a bad change. 
My point came when I arrived at the age of 30, um, 11 years ago. And I did something that changed my life. I went back for the first time to our root strip back to Ethiopia. And let me tell you this, Ethiopia is a beautiful country, really. One of the beautiful places I've ever been. Not because I was born there, just because she is beautiful. And I saw a beautiful culture with beautiful people. I went back to the village that I was born. I saw friends of my family. They told me how much they miss the Ethiopian Jewish community who used to live there. They told me about my father, who used to be a very important person in the village. And they told me how one night the Ethiopian Jewish community left and, 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 and gone and, and went to a new place. And when I came back from this trip, I came back a different person. I came back even more proud Jew because to see the place that your forefather came to Judaism, it automatically makes you feel much more proud Jew. A proud Israeli because when you get to see the, the, the situation and the place that my parents uh, lived in the village of Ethiopia, you are more proud Israeli. But none less important, I came back a proud black man. Black is beautiful. And this is me, Naftali Aklum. I'm Jew, I'm a black man, I'm an Israeli. This is the whole package. I took all my little identities and I create one strong identity. When I came back from this trip, my father was a very sick man. He was lying on the, in Soroka hospital in Beersheba. So the first step would be to visit my dad and to tell him about my experience. So I sat down in his room and I told my dad about my trip. And I told him one more thing. I told my dad that I love him. I admire him. And for me, my, you are, he is a hero. And why it's so important? Because it took me 30 years to tell my dad that I love him, admire him, and that I think that he is a hero. You see, no one told us when we were kids that our parents walked 300 miles in the desert, that our parents left everything behind just because they had a dream. We always grow up knowing that the government of Israel saved and brought our parents, which is true. But no one told us about what our parents did in order to be here. Once I knew that, I saw my parents as heroes. Because to be honest with you, I'm not sure that if I was there in the same situation, I'm not sure I would do that, but they did that. So that's why they are heroes. And that was the first time that I told my dad that I love him and I see him as a hero. 10 days after that meeting, my dad passed away. It was like he was waiting for me to say this word so that he would be able to rest in peace. Few months ago, few months ago, few years ago, I got a call from um, Hollywood telling me that they're working on a movie called The Red Sea Diving Resort, which is a Hollywood movie that tells the story of how the Mossad brought the Ethiopian Jews from Sudan to Israel. They wanted me to be um, image consulate for this, for this movie. And I was so happy because our story finally made it to, to Hollywood. And in this movie, we have actors like Chris Evans, Captain America. By the way, Chris Evans is playing in this movie the same Mossad agent that came to save my brother in Sudan in 1979, Danny Limo. Holly Bennett is on this movie. 
Michael K. Williams. Uh, by the way, Michael K. Williams is playing my brother in this movie. We wanted uh, Denzel Washington to play my brother, but unfortunately, um, I mean, he's very expensive. Uh, we have Ben Kingsley and lots of great actors in this movie. So if you didn't see this movie yet, it's on Netflix uh, and you can watch the movie. Um, I have the trailer here, but we don't have time. So I will skip the trailer. My brother was a Mossad agent from 1979 until 2003. Unfortunately, he passed away um, in 2009 from a reason that we don't know. And today, my brother is a big hero here in Israel, not only among the Ethiopian Jewish community, but throughout the society. Uh, he's a very well-known person. You will find street, garden, square after his name. And as a family, we are very proud of him. Um, in my community, they call him uh, Modern Moses because he was the one that opened the gates for the Ethiopian Jews to fulfill their dream to return back home to Zion after more than 2,500 years. Um, and his story is a mirror to the story of the Ethiopian Jews. Uh, lately, we wrote a book called The Story, uh, The Power of One, uh, a book that tells the story, life story of my brother. And um, if you would like to have this book, please let, uh, let me know and I will be able to send it. And very soon we will have it on Amazon. Uh, so you will be able to buy it from Amazon. Uh, lately, uh, with the help of Jewish National Fund, we were able to translate this book from its original Hebrew to English. And um, I would like to end this presentation and to allow you to, you know, to, to ask questions uh, with some word of our Prime Minister, Benjamin Netanyahu, speak about the importance of the story of the Ethiopian Jews uh, to the Israeli society and to Jews all over the world. משפחת אקלום היקרה, אזרחים ואזרחות נכבדים. סיפור עלייתם של יהודי אתיופיה הוא אחד מסיפורי הגבורה המרתקים בהיסטוריה של עמנו. אבל זה סיפור שלא נחשף במידה הראויה לציבור הישראלי. החברה הישראלית אינה יודעת על המנהיגים פורצי הדרך. הם נטלו על עצמם סיכון חיים ופרצו דרך לרבבות של משפחות להגיע לציון. הם יצאו באישון לילה, לעיתים עם צרום מטלטלים קטן, צעדו בלילות, מרחק של מאות קילומטרים, תוך התמודדות עם כל הקשיים שבדרך. הקושי הפיזי, ההליכה אל הלא נודע, התקפות של שודדים, רוצחים אפילו, צמא, רעב, מחלות. בני משפחות רבות לא עמדו במאמץ ומתו בדרך. צריך רצון מברזל, חלום וכמיהה לירושלים, כדי להתמודד עם כל האתגרים הללו. היה לכם את זה. הייתה לכם כמיהה עתיקת יומין לאורך דורות לציון. כמיהה שדחפה את המשפחות למסע המיוחד הזה. עד היום כמעט לא דובר ולא סופר סיפור הגבורה הזה, אבל כעת יש הזדמנות לתקן. כעת יש הזדמנות להביא את סיפור עליית יהודי אתיופיה כחלק מפסיפס סיפורי העלייה של יהודים מכל חלקי תבל. ללא הסיפור שלכם, מארג ההיסטוריה שלנו חסר. אני רוצה למלא את החסר הזה. אני מבקש להודות ליוזמי הכנס על ההזדמנות להביא לקדמת השיח הציבורי את סיפור הגבורה יוצא הדופן של פרדה יזזו אקלום, זיכרונו לברכה. פרדה היה חלוץ שפרץ יחד עם אנשי המוסד את הנתיב לעלייתם של יהודי אתיופיה לישראל דרך סודאן. בעקבותיו באו עוד רבים. כל אחד תרם כמידת יכולתו, אבל המשותף לכולם היה שהם התעלו מעבר לאינטרסים המשפחתיים או האישיים הצרים וסייעו לקהילה כולה. נתינה שכזו, אומץ לב שכזה. אלה ראויים שיהיו מודל לחיקוי לדור הבא של מדינת ישראל. ברכותיי לכם, לכולכם.
So thank you so much uh, and God bless you all. And uh, I think we have another 15 minutes for uh, questions. So please feel free. I will stop sharing now. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is uh, Dimitri Mevzos. I'm from WZWK. First of all, I would like uh, to thank you, Naftali, for this fascinating story. I, I heard about it a couple of times, but I mean, for, for, uh, to listen just, I, I, you know, Ole Hadash by myself, and to listen this from you, it's, it's, it's really amazing, and, 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 the, and the heroic, you know, history about you, your brother, it's, it's just amazing. Thank you very much uh, for being with us. I would like to thank you to uh, our friends in Golinkin Zadev and Aaron from Glasgow. I would like to say thank you to all the audience we have here. It's just amazing the geography where people coming from Surrey, Houston, Manchester, Norfolk, Yorkshire, Wallasey. Wow, guys, it's amazing. Thank you very much for joining us. And let's go to the chat and see your questions. Okay. And Okay, the first question, are there any Jews left in Ethiopia? Okay, that's a great question. In Ethiopia, we have, that's my daughter, she's coming from time to time. Uh, sorry. Uh, in, in, um, in Ethiopia, we have what we call the Falashmura. The Falashmura is a group of Jews that their forefathers converted into Christianity in the late 19th century. And now we have about 5,000 who are still waiting in camps in Gondar and in Addis Ababa. And I hope that um, the government of Israel will bring them as soon as possible because they have families here and they have to reunite with them. Did you hear me? Uh, uh, sorry, I was uh, sorry. Yeah, yeah, I was on mute. Sorry. How many Jews of Ethiopian decent life in Israel today, in general? What is their status within general Israeli society? Okay, so today we have one hundred fifty thousand Ethiopian Jews live in Israel, which is less than two percent of the population here in Israel. But it's a very young community, uh, sixty percent under the age of forty which means it's a very young community. Uh, we are small, but um, I mean, uh, you know, we are small, but in, in, in the same time, we have a woman, which is a minister in the government of Israel, minister of uh, immigration. We have a vice minister. Um, and so, so we are a small community, but we are everywhere. Thank you for this. Uh, the next question is from Corinne. Uh, did Israel have to have a secret deal with Sudan, a Muslim state, to ensure the safe aliyah of these Ethiopian Jews? No. Uh, well, it was uh, uh, at that time there was no deal between uh, Israel and it, uh, Israel never had a diplomatic relationship with Sudan until recently. Uh, so we didn't, in the 70s, there was no diplomatic relationship uh, and the Mossad worked there as um, without the knowing of the government of Sudan. For example, the movie, The Red Sea Diving Resort, it's telling the story of how the Mossad uh, rent a resort that during the day was to be supposed to be a place that people diving and in the night from there, they used to, to, to take the Ethiopian Jews to the sea and from the sea with the help of the Navy to Israel. So there was no uh, uh, agreement with the Sudanese government to bring the Ethiopian Jews from Sudan to Israel. Thank you. Uh, Shalom Naftali, how do you think has advanced the integration of Ethiopian Jews in Israel and how has changed the situation of your communities since the first ones made Aliyah? Well, lots of change. Uh, so at the beginning, as I said, uh, it was tough, uh, not easy. Uh, still, we have lots of challenges. Uh, for example, from time to time, we do suffer from racism, discrimination, and police brutality. Uh, it's still there. Uh, but 
I'm a person that uh, always look at the good things in life. And we have made a big step forward uh, to the society. And today you will find a lot of people in a uh, very good uh, position, such as politician. We have uh, a pilot in the Israeli Air Force. We have doctors in hospitals. And, and the most important thing is that um, sorry, uh, my, my, her mom went to a wedding, so she, uh, she had to stay with me. Anyway, uh, we are, uh, the most important thing is that 20 years ago, uh, in a family, you would, you would not find someone who have a degree. I mean, going to university was not something that Ethiopian family used to do. Uh, everyone worked uh, to, you know, pay the bills. But today, in every family, you will find two or three that have a degree, which means we're going to universities with the help of the Israeli government. And when you have a degree, there is a big possibility that you will find a good job. If you will find a good job, uh, probably you will make a good money. If you will make a good money, you will be able to leave uh, the old neighborhood to a new neighborhood. And so this is the situation now. We still have lots of challenges, but in the same time, we have lots of success. Thank you for this. It's fascinating. Uh, do you still have the Torah from Ethiopia in your community? Well, we don't have it in our own community. Um, we, uh, many, not well, the Kesim, which is our spiritual leaders, they brought some, uh, we call it Orit uh, in Amharit or in Tigrinya. They brought some with them and uh, some of them just put them in the Israeli museum in Jerusalem so that the government and the museum will keep them for generations to come. Um, and uh, so, I, I mean, here we accept the oral Torah. So uh, uh, for example, in Ethiopia, we never celebrated uh, holidays like Hanukkah and Purim uh, because those are holidays from the Oral Torah. Uh, of course, today we celebrate all the holidays because we accept uh, the Oral Torah. So we have our own synagogues like uh, the people from Morocco have their own synagogue or the community from uh, Iraq. Uh, we have uh, in every city you will find Ethiopian synagogue, but uh, we pray the same uh, such as the other. Uh, thank you. Can most young Ethiopian Israeli children today speak Amharic as well as Ivrit? Well, unfortunately, I don't speak Amharic because um, Dima, remember I told you that when I was a young man, I was embarrassed, embarrassed about my parents. And we wanted to be part of the Israeli society. And we thought the best way to be part of the Israeli society will be to delete our history, to delete uh, the language that our parents came from. We thought that this is the best way. And due to that, I don't speak today Amharic. And I feel guilty and I don't feel good with myself that I don't speak. Uh, but uh, now we know that the best way to be in the Israeli society is to keep what you came from. Uh, it can be from every country because that makes you unique. That's the beauty of our society. Everyone come with something and we are not the same. That's the beauty of it. Uh, so today, unfortunately, not a lot of young people are knowing Amharit. I'm trying to teach my daughter here to learn so that she will be able to learn this uh, uh, beautiful language. Um, and, 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 and as activists, what we are trying to do, it's we are trying to create more programs in schools and uh, after day school so that uh, this young generation will respect their history, will be proud of them as black people, as Jews from Ethiopia, so we are doing that. This is what we can do. Uh, you spoke about the memorial 
uh, of your brother. Where is it in Israel? If it's in Israel, yes. So the memorial is for all the Jews who left, uh, who passed away, who perished their life on their way to Sudan. Uh, it's everywhere. It's uh, in every city. For example, in my city tomorrow, we will have uh, a memorial for the 4,000 Ethiopian Jews who didn't make it and died on the way. Uh, on Monday, it will be on Mount Herzl alongside the president of Israel and the prime minister of Israel. Um, so it's, it's everywhere in the country, everywhere. Uh, and not only where there are Jews of Ethiopia, it can be a, a, a small kibbutz that don't have Ethiopian Jews, but still they will make a memorial event for the 4,000 Ethiopian Jews who didn't make it. Uh, Dima, you are on mute. That, that is not a question. There's a couple of people just writing it down. Your daughter is beautiful. Your daughter has a beautiful smile. I have um, a question. Sorry. Uh, if, uh, if you have a question, can I kindly please ask to write it in chat? Uh, it will be really appreciated. I'd like to ask why I heard all the time, Ethiopian, Ethiopian, you arrived to Israel. Why don't you mix up with the whole Israeli society? Why to keep yourself to yourself? That, I mean, I heard him saying about 100 times, I'm a black, uh, a proud Ethiopian. I, I was brought up and I am bringing up children. The father is not uh, Mizrahi or is Israeli. I never had the uh, need to insist upon emphasizing that I'm an Israeli I come from a Sephardi family and I'm a proud, I'm a proud Israeli. And that's what I expected to hear for him. And I didn't hear it. I didn't hear him saying, I'm happy to be in Israel. I'm happy to have the chance to uh, grow Enough in Israel, said already. educated in Israel. Other people Wait, have changed. Now, don't inter inter that's interrupt enough. me. Why, why all the time putting the, I'm a black, None of us have got a color. The thing that said that united us is being Jewish and living in Israel or not in Israel, but not the color. The color never been taken in account. Mira, thank you for your question. Okay. Uh, so first of all, Mira, thank you so much for your question. But in my life, the color is something that uh, in my life, the color is something that goes with me everywhere. For example, when I'm coming to uh, Heathrow Airport in London, people don't see the Jewish in me. People see the first thing they see is the color of my skin. And uh, for lots of times, as I mentioned before, I didn't like the color of my skin and I, I, I I mean, I, I felt the same thing that you said right now. I'm Israeli and I'm, and I'm only this. But from my experience in my life and from the things that I've been experienced in my life as a black man, uh, I realized that this is also part of me. And everyone all the time around the world, people remind me the color of my skin. It's not that I'm, I'm, I'm busy with that all the time. But when I'm traveling in the world, and not only in the world, even in my own country, in Israel, and I love Israel, it's my country, I don't have any other place. From time to time, people are being um, uh, 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 bad to me only because the color of my skin. So first I have to accept myself and I have to accept the color of myself because this is part of me. The same thing that I'm Jew, I'm an Israeli, I'm a black man. In the world, I'm not an Israeli, I'm not a Jew, I'm a black man. People don't see my passport, people don't see the religious within me. All they see is my color. So it's part of me. And, uh, and, and I love that part. The same thing that I love being Jew, I love being an Israeli. This is me, this is... This is the whole package, as I mentioned before. 
Thank you, Naftali. Uh, a bit different question. Um, uh, are you still use forms of the liturgy your ancestors use in Ethiopia, or is blended with Ashkenazi or Sephardi liturgies? Uh, uh, please repeat the question again. Yes, yeah, sorry. You still use forms of the liturgy when of your ancestors used in Ethiopia, or it's blended with the Ashkenazi or Sephardi liturgies? So, uh, uh, interesting question. Depend on where you're coming from uh, in Ethiopia. In Ethiopia, we have most of the Jews that came here uh, from Ethiopia are mainly from the Gondar area, which is 70% of the Ethiopian Jews. My family came from the uh, region of Tigray, 30% of the Ethiopian Jews who live here in Israel. The Tigrinian people were the first to come to Israel, Tigrinian Jews. Uh, and we accept and blended with the Rabbanites here in Israel. Uh, the Jews that came from the area of Gondar, they are more keeping their tradition uh, from Ethiopia. And uh, in general, we are going after the Sfaradim. Okay, thank you very much for this answer. Um... <laughs> Uh, okay, I see. Yes, we don't I, have. Yeah, sorry. I have some, some questions. I have some questions. Yes, please. Good evening. I just would like to take this opportunity to thank you, uh, Naftali, for uh, sharing his 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 story. It, it was really fascinating. Uh, I would also like to take this opportunity to thank you, the state of Israel, for doing a brilliant job in bringing uh, the Ethiopian Israeli communities from Sudan and, and, and from Ethiopia, of course, especially from, 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 from the mouth of Mengistu Haile Mariam. But uh, the state of Israel has been doing really, really very well in, in educating the Ethiopian Jews, uh, in giving them jobs, uh, doing a lot of good stuff. But in the last, in the last few years, there has been so many issues, issues especially to do with racism, discrimination, police brutality. Th these issues are, have all become a headline. I just want to know what are the Israeli Ethiopians community doing in order to, to deal with these kind of issues? Because the state of Israel has done so much for them. Well, uh thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Getown. Um, well, it, we, have, we have a new generation here of young Ethiopian Israelis who live here, who were educated here, which means we know our rights and we know how to fight for our rights. Um, mainly, most of the time, uh, what we are trying to do and different activists, it's to demonstrate and to raise awareness uh, about, uh, you know, uh, discrimination, uh, racism, and police brutality. Uh, and we're trying to push lots of politicians to make laws against racism, discrimination, and of course, to fight against the police brutality. What I am doing, and I believe that if you want to solve the problem from the root, you have to educate people. Education is the key. And uh, we will always have racism and discrimination. We will never ever will be able to delete it till the end, but we have to try to minimize it. And how do we do it? It's to educate the people, not only the Israeli society, to educate the young people from our community how to deal when they see and face racism. When I was a kid and we had someone who, became, who was racist to us. I remember that we used to fight with him. And in the end, we ended up in the police station. So it was not smart to do it. Now, when I see, not only in Israel, but all over the world, when I see someone who is racist to me, I really feel sorry for him. You know, I feel sorry for him because maybe he is a racist person because his self-confidence is very low. Maybe he, will, he grew up like this. He was taught like this. So I'm trying in my project, 
years in my uh, social uh, um, uh, project to let people know who we are, to work and to speak with police station because sometimes there is a big gap between the modern world we are living today and to the world we used to live in Ethiopia. And the way of life and the way and the culture, it's different. And, and we have to close this gap. And how do we close this gap? You know, we have to speak, we have to teach, we have to negotiate, we, you know, we have to, we have to do something and to educate people. And this is what I believe in the end will minimize uh, the issues of racism and discrimination, uh, um, you know, here in Israel. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much uh, for this evening. There is a lot of, lot of words which sent to Naftali. I promised what I will send uh, all the chat communication. Kola Kavod, bravo Naftali. Thank you for sharing this fascinating story, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, thank you very much, Naftali, about your story. It's, it, uh, could you please mute yourself still, ladies and gentlemen? Okay, and, and thank you to all our amazing audience for uh, uh, staying with us. And uh, I would like to just say one quote uh, of Herzl, probably, which uh, I think will uh, perfectly fit to, uh, to the story of Naftali. If you will it, it's not a dream. And this is what probably happened with the uh, Jews of Ethiopia. They will it and they came to State of Israel. Thank you very much. Have a good evening. Stay safe and see, uh, see you in our future lectures. Thank you, Naftali. All the Thank best. You. Good night.